Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to you, wherever you are in the world. I am Tigris Osborne. I am the executive director of NAFA, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. Welcome to the NAFA webinar series. Um, we are so excited to have you joining us for our first episode of 2024. And with us today are comedians Nikki Bailey and Chris Grace, who we're going to get into it with in just a minute about fat representation and body size stuff in Hollywood. Uh, before we do that, just a couple of um, uh, announcements and reminders for those of you who are new to us. Um, if you've never been with NAFA before, um, as I said, we are the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. Since 1969, we have worked hard to change perceptions of fat and fat people and to end size discrimination through education, advocacy, and support. You can learn more about our programs at naafa.org. And you can also follow us on your favorite social media apps um, at NAFA official. And <clears throat> excuse me, we offer programs like this, virtual events like this, other kinds of fun and educational programs to our community at no charge because of the support of our donor committee community, which includes people just like you from all over the US and in fact, all over the world. Um, so thank you to all of our donors out there. If you are one of them, thank you very much. And if you would like to contribute to NAFA so that we can keep on offering this kind of programming for free, you can also do that at our website, naafa.org slash give. Um, I will just uh, remind everyone that we do record our webinar series for YouTube so that folks who can't be with us live are able to join us later or get this education, get these good times later. Um, but I will also remind you that it is prohibited for you to record or to use our um, intellectual property without express consent from NAFA. So uh, please keep that in mind as you are here with us this evening. And let's meet our guest. Um, first of all, Nikki Bailey is a writer, performer, director, published author, and Emmy-nominated producer and podcast host and producer. She was nominated for two Emmy Awards for her work as a producer on PBS specials and went on to work on and write for other television productions, including Labor and Delivery, Women Docs, This Far in Faith, African American Spiritual Journeys, Nikki is the author of Soul Smarts, Four Day Starts, 31 Days of Creative Inspiration and Activities. Her article, Girl, I Am So Over Church, is featured in the book <laughs> Faithfully Feminist, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Feminists on Why We Stay. She was featured comedian for Lonnie Love's Laugh Off on BET's The Real. Nikki is the creator of Fatch Comedy, the fat sketch show, which I know some of you are already fans of, which features a cast of fat and fabulous funny ladies who sold out shows at UCB in Los Angeles and San Francisco Sketch Fest. Nikki recently wrote, directed, and starred in a short film called The Crossroads. You can follow her at Nikki Bailey underscore on Instagram, TikTok, and X, and we'll drop those links in the chat for you. I'd also like to introduce you to Chris Grace. Um, Chris has been an actor and stand-up comic for over 10 years. He performed in numerous festivals and contests, uh, including winning first place in the Riot Festival National Comedy Contest in his hometown of Houston, Texas. He also best uh, also won Best of Fest Awards at Big Pine, Laughter After Dark, Comedy Chateau, and the Burbank Comedy Festival at Flappers. We're going to also hear more about um, Chris's acting work and some other things that he's been producing. You can follow him at Chris Grace Comedy. Nikki and Chris, welcome to the NAFA webinar series. Thank you uh, for having me. So nice to see you. Um, we always start with origin stories. So, um, Nikki, I'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about like how you came to be doing what you are doing today as a performer and producer. So I took this circuitous route to where I am now. I started out um, working in television and then uh, left TV and went to graduate school to get a Master of Divinity. I'm trained in ministry, actually, which I don't do anymore because crazy. Um, 
<laughs> but I uh, I left that and then worked in corporate me- corporate uh, training for a while. And then when I got laid off about eight years ago, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go back to TV. And I decided to move to L.A. and use my television superpowers for good here. And um, so that's what I've been doing. And I and I love it. I, I love uh, doing stand up comedy. I love writing comedy. Uh, and I'm just really excited to be here with you guys. Thanks. Chris, what was your road from Houston to Hollywood? Um, my road is somewhat like straightforward in that I just started doing drama in junior high and I have never stopped. Sort of like I went to college for it. And I, I mean, I've had bunches of day jobs and I have other careers, but I sort of never stopped doing theater and comedy. And uh, I just sort of never quit, (laughs) Um, which is like probably the secret to um, not, uh, I mean, yeah, I guess I'm, you're guaranteed to fail if you quit. And so I just never quit. (laughs) And I just sort of like survived until recent success. And what, what made you start? Like, why did you become a theater kid? I actually just, I just really liked it. Like, um, I don't know. I was always a very like creative little kid and I, you know, okay. So it was a combination of it was create. I was a creative little kid. I loved doing it. I loved like just pretending and coming up with the, you know, imagination, like imaginary situations and solutions and stuff like that. And then around high school that combined with, um, people telling me that they didn't think I could do it, which I'm very uh, anti-authority and very, people telling me what I can do. And so I, which I have actually tried to like get away from a little bit as an adult, because it's not always productive. But um, basically, I have taken lots of motivation throughout the years from people telling me that I couldn't do something. (laughs) Um, So actually, I I played classical piano from like third grade till my senior year in high school. And when I was graduating high school, I was actually trying to decide between majoring in piano or majoring in acting. And I mean, it, well, it came down to two things. One is that my piano teacher was like, I think you're a little too lazy to be a piano major, which is true. Cause there's a piano majors are very lonely. Like they're, in, they're, they're practicing a lot, but there are also lots of people telling me that they didn't think I should go into drama. Uh, and I was like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> and it only took me 30 years to prove them wrong. <laughs> Well, I, I love that rebelliousness and I feel like it, it sort of echoes through the movement that we do our work in around like what people tell you you can and can't do as yeah. a fat person. I should say we um, and should have said to our audience at the beginning for folks who are new, obviously it's right there in our name. We use that F word. Y'all can use the other F word if you want to guess, but we, you know, but the but the but the but the word fat we use all the time and um and unapologetically around here. Um, and uh, and so when I think about that sort of like that same sort of idea of like what folks tell fat people they can and can't do. Um, but let's talk about how y'all feel about that word and how like sort of what your body identity is like um, and how that has impacted you in, in your careers. Um, Chris, let's start with you this time. Like, is that a word that you use? How do you feel about, like, what are the, what's the language you use about your bodies? Do you have a politic around body stuff? So um, I do use that word. I mean, I, I, I'm, <coughs> I'll just be completely honest about how I feel. And I hope that it can be a, like, uh, uh, I don't, I actually don't think that many people may relate to this. It's just because I've met a lot of, of fat people. And also I like, fat guys are like my type. So I've like dated fat guys my whole life. So I, I've known a lot of fat guys. And, uh, uh, but the interesting thing for me, as I like talk to people about this kind of stuff is that I actually have never had like significant body issues with like how fat I am or not. Um, I, I've probably had more issues around like my race in America, but in terms of being fat, like I have never had an issue like, reconciling what I see in the mirror versus what I think I am. And it hasn't, it's, I guess it's affected my confidence. It's, it's been an interesting journey because so, um, 
there have been some times where like a doctor might say I might need to lose weight because of like I have high blood pressure or something like that. And sometimes I will try to do something to lose weight, but it'll be because literally I the hard it's hard for me sometimes because like literally I'm trying to lose weight so that a, a number on a piece of paper is low enough so a doctor doesn't yell at me. <laughs> like um which is actually like not very motivating to be honest. Um but what's interesting then is to I and I guess what I'm saying is that I feel pretty confident and I, like I I feel very like in my body and like I'm pretty happy with my body. So then it's interesting to enter an industry like acting where um uh whether or not I'm happy with my body other people have opinions about it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been a really interesting challenge um because you know everybody in our everybody can be all kinds of people in their lives the stories of their lives they could be the hero they could be the villain they could be the sidekick they could be the love interest um we're all going through that every day in different ways with all the people we re- we relate with in acting your the sh- the silhouette of your body sort of determines an initial assessment of like which one of those stories you're going to get to tell uh which is a really interesting thing that's like not like reality like everybody in in reality has love in their life and has a love story right um but if you're being filmed on a camera suddenly it's like well we're not interested in that person's love story <laughs> um so that's been an interesting thing to reconcile with so I definitely want to go back to talking specifically about getting to play the love interest and I know lots of folks probably recognize you from being a love interest on Super. Right. Yeah. Um, but let's let's before we go back to that, let's hear a little bit from Nikki about the F word. How do you feel about the F word, Nikki? I love the F word. Um I use it regularly, uh proudly. Uh I when I was younger, didn't feel great about myself, didn't feel great about how I looked and dieted a lot as a younger person. And uh sometime in my 30s, I just sort of decided I was done with that. And, you know, having read fat liberation literature and 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 really immersed myself in what it means to be free in this body that I have today on any given day. This is the body I'm going to have. I have to, you know, I'm going to live in it and I'm going to live well. And so um, so that, so I became sort of an activist, a fat activist when I was younger. And then when I moved here to Los Angeles to pursue acting, um, the reaction to my body was so dramatic that I, that it knocked me off my axis. I had been this really confident person who, who didn't have, you know, a ton of body shame. And I walked around sort of feeling like I'm, I'm the shit, you know what I'm saying? And then, uh, and then I got to LA, I got to Hollywood and, and all of that just got knocked off, off course. And I ended up, um, giving in to the, the, the diet mindset and I had weight loss surgery and then almost died. Um, and so that experience made me real realize that number one, it made me come back to my values as a, as a fat person, that this is the body I'm in and I'm going to love it today, no matter what. Um, but it also, it also highlighted for me exactly how dangerous the diet industry is and, um, and how easy it is to get caught up in it and swayed by it to the point where, you know, I put my life on the line to, to lose weight and, and ultimately, I'm happy being who I am on any given day. So I don't need to change what I look like to try to get cast in roles. What I have discovered is that I get uh, called into audition for particular types of things. So I'm always like a nurse or um, a teacher or uh, a maid. (laughs) There's, there's always There's kind of a, like, and I, I agree with Chris that my, my, my race has also played a, played a factor, a a part in that as well. Um, because I, if you talk to me on the phone, I, I talk like this, you know, like there's no way I don't use a whole lot of, what do they call it? Remember they used to call it Ebonics, but I don't use a lot of African American vernacular English. And so... So, um, I mean, I do, I can, and I, I code switch with everybody else, but, um, but what I've noticed is that like, I don't get booked for 
the roles where I have to act black uh, because I because I talk like Becky. So uh, so so between <coughs> between the race and the weight stuff, it's a lot to navigate. But for me, it's about staying true to who I am and about sort of keeping my values in mind at all times. Nikki, are there roles that you feel like people have tried to pigeonhole you in um, specifically because of the combination of being fat and black? Yeah, uh, I, I I can't tell you. I've had to, to, to explain to my agents that I'm not going out for diet commercials and that if the, the breakdown for the character says, you know, fat, sloppy, uh, you know, like all the stereotypes of, of fatness, uh, I'm like, I don't send me that. I'm not going to, I'm not going to audition for that. I won't audition for, or play roles that, um, that affirm the negative stereotypes of fatness. I just won't do it. So is that where you are now? Or is that where you have always been? Like, have you ever played a role like that, that you now look back and, and at the time you just thought like, I gotta make this money. I, I gotta make this money. No, I, I honestly haven't had, I haven't had to do it. The one thing with Fat, the sketch comedy group that I, that I started, um, what we liked to do was take some of those stereotypes and just turn them on their end and, and make fun of them in some ways. Um, but no, I've never, I've never had to take a, a job that felt like gross in that way. Chris, have you ever had to take a job that you, um, from where you are now that you're like, oh, I, eh, I shouldn't have done that. Um, um, that I shouldn't have done. Yeah. I don't, I'm trying to think back if I have, I mean, I've definitely done things. It's funny because I know I've, I had a part in a commercial once where my original part was very small. And then there was a part that was a guy wearing a thong and the guy who, uh, originally was going to do it, didn't want to do it. And then they offered it to me instead. And I know that from the outside, part of the image was like, oh, it's this fat guy in a thong. But I also thought I looked good in it. So like I did it like, you know, like, yes. um, it kind of did like probably <laughs> affirm the idea that like, oh my God, it's so funny that this guy's like a guy this size is wearing a thong. But I was, I don't know. I was just like, I didn't see it that way. So, um, you know, I've been in a couple things like that where like, um, uh, I, where someone's initial response to something might be like, Oh, this is not the type of person that would be playing this role. Um, I was in a off Broadway musical. That was a parody of 50 shades of gray. And I played Christian gray. And there was a very, um, visceral response. Like whenever I came out, as him in in the show that was like a bunch of people disappointed that I was playing the character but I almost I would almost always win the audience over by the end of the show and I was also in like a wrestling singlet in that show too <laughs> um and of course like what people forget is like for for the folks in the audience who were disappointed there's somebody else who was like this is so much better than the original yeah well I also learned in that um show that um uh, that was a very, I would say the demographic of the audience tended to be more women. I mean, I assume that the, the following of the book is probably more women than men. Um, but I learned from doing that show that I could start with an audience of people that were like actively hostile to me being on stage. And if I was good enough in the show, after the show, they would be wanting to take their picture with me. <laughs> and so it actually did like teach me a lot about like, um, you know, there's a visual thing that they had at the beginning and then they like learned more about the person and, and then their mind changed, which is like such a human thing. Like I'm sure we've all experienced that, but it's kind of like, uh, I, I learned it eight shows a week for a couple months. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, well, obviously like Christian Gray is at least thought of as a sexy character, whether we um, all think that or not. Mm -hmm. Um, and what, so let's go back to that, what we put a pin in earlier about like sort of the being the romantic lead or getting to be the sexy person. Um, Chris, tell, for folks who don't know, talk a little bit about your role um, on Superstore and what it meant to get to be, um, you know, to be a romantic lead, but also in a comedy setting. Yeah. So uh, 
Um, I was like brought in as a very like temporary, like one episode character that uh, Sandra, who's a regular on Superstore, the character, uh, like dated in a bar once. And then basically this like love triangle ended up happening between my character is named Jerry, Sandra, and Carol. And it became this like very dr dramatic, melodramatic thing between the three of us over the years. And then in the like, I think the fifth season, my character and Jerry, uh, my character Jerry and Sandra got married. And so it became the like, if you don't know television, but there's these things called sweeps months where and this is really more an old school television thing, but it was like, these are the months that are really important for advertising. So we've got to, like, if you're a kid and you remember this, it's like, this is like, you know, JR got shot and we're going to reveal the killer or whatever. And it's during this certain month, they're building up these big events. And so the wedding of Sandra and Jerry was like the NBC event of the month. And they were putting out like social media ads with like my face on it. And it was so surreal for so many reasons that like for me to be the like, uh, romantic interest, but also like the, like the PR event for NBC was crazy. Um, yeah, a chubby, actually, a chubby Asian wedding as the yeah. focal point of a mainstream like media conglomerate for yeah. even like, 30 seconds would be amazing. But for Sweeps Week is amazing. Well, I, what I'll say about that show about Superstore in general is that, first of all, Superstore is actually like one of the uh, just one of the biggest sources of Asian uh, American representation, maybe in the history of television. Like if you look at the cast of Superstore, um, there are so many Asian people on it. And I, it was just sort of like, it was never like, it didn't seem like an intentional thing on their part, but it, it ended up having like seven actors on it that were Asian, which was like just very impressive to me. And also like, you know, a Filipino character who spoke Tagalog on screen. And, um, but going back to the, the thing with Sandra and Jerry, what I also loved about that was like, Sandra and Jerry like had a like active sex life. Um, like there was, there was nothing in it that was like, wow, these, I can't believe these fat people are getting, like, it was never in the material. And then there were, there's a scene in, in Superstore where I have almost like, I, I know I have my shirt off. I think it was where my, I was in my underwear. Like it was like a fairly for network television, like a lot of skin mm -hmm. for a network comedy which we also shot a more explicit version of that was uh, blocked by the censors. <laughs> but, Can we um, find that on YouTube? <laughs> I know. I, I got it. So we were shooting it. And um, um, so it's, it's, we're having sex in an office in, in the superstore, like in the big box store that's in superstore. And so uh, Kaliko, who plays Sandra, is sitting in uh, the office chair. Okay, the one that made it on television was, oh, the one that made it on television was, I was sitting in the office chair and she was straddling me, but nothing else was shown. Okay, I'm just gonna paint this picture. The, the one that we shot was, she was sitting in the office chair and I poked my head up from under the desk. <laughs> and while we sh were shooting it, I was like, um, they're not gonna air this, there's no way. And they were like, we checked it with lawyers, it's fine. I was like, there's no way they're letting me Pop my head up from under this desk. <laughs> There's <laughs> nothing else I could have been doing. Uh, so we actually had to go back like three months later and reshoot the scene. But um, it was, uh, they never treated it on that show as like, the joke is these two people are in love. Like it was never that. It was always stuff that was much more specific. Yeah, I loved that about it. What about you, Nikki? What, um, when do you get to be the ingenue or when do you get to be the love interest? Never. I never get to be the love interest. I have never been cast in that role. And so um, I have, so whenever I'm writing something new, I write, I write a romantic scene for myself in it. Like, cause I'm always writing for myself because eventually I'd like to one day have my own show. Um, and so I'm always writing something with like a really sexy co-star so that I, so that when I get cast in it, I can uh, make out with Sterling Brown, you know, somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, well, let's talk a little bit more about writing your own roles. And uh, you mentioned Fatch. Uh, tell the folks who don't know anything about Fatch a little bit more about that. 
Fatch is Fat plus Sketch equals Fatch Comedy. We are a group of uh, six fat women who uh, who do sketch comedy that deals um, directly with fatness and and what it means to be fat in this country and 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 survive and thrive. And so part of what the goal was for me was um, I, I was having a hard time getting cast in anything where I got to do anything fun or funny that wasn't, you know, um, well, where I just wasn't getting cast. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to start my own thing and see if that will allow me to, to do some of the funny roles that I've been dying to do. And and it took off. So we were really blessed to have a really great, you know, experience with it. And, uh, and we got to travel with it and uh, it was a lot of fun. I loved it. We, we have unfortunately, uh, disbanded because people have moved away, but, uh, but we are completely up for, if you decide that you have an event and you want a sketch, a fat sketch comedy team, we will get the band back together. So, yeah. So you heard it here, y'all. We should crowdsource for a fast reunion for something. Ooh, yes. That would be so fun. Um, Chris, I know that you have um, also been doing some writing, producing, and some of, you know, creating your own shows. Um, will you tell folks what your connection is to uh, Scarlett Johansson? <laughs> yeah. So uh, last year I created a show called Chris Grace as Scarlett Johansson, which is my tribute to uh, our country's greatest Asian American actor, <laughs> Scarlett Johansson. Uh, this is more about the fact that Scarlett Johansson at times has taken roles maybe that are like questionable in terms of what she should be playing or I don't know. Um, it's a you funny can say thing. It. Well, the funny thing is that, like, I felt much stronger. I felt more um, strident about it before I started writing the show. Mm. And so the show is still, like, uh, definitely critical of some of the decisions that she's made. But it's also started to become a biography about me. So um, the it, what happens with me, at least, is when I start thinking about issues, I start to get more complicated and more, like... Um, I feel like I can become less clear that I know exactly what the answer is to a situation the more, the deeper I dive into it. Uh, but it's also just a funny show I created for Edinburgh Fringe last year. Uh, you get to see me in uh, a red wig and a Black Widow outfit. Uh, just a little nice. quick plug, I'm doing it in LA at the Elysian next week. So please come out. <laughs> Ooh. But, but it's been interesting. Um, I mean, that show is also kind of about like, uh like bodies in a way you know um it's a i mean it's funny because her justification for taking this film called ghost in the shell um where the character was japanese in the original material was that it wasn't really a human person that um like a japanese android didn't really have an identity and so which is kind of like uh a very weird thing to say about like, I guess a Japanese person is like a computer that doesn't have like, like they're like a machine that doesn't have an identity. Um, uh, and so it's been a lot of thinking about like what it's like to like be in different bodies and also how people see you that way. That my show has a thing in it where I am wearing a Black Widow costume and I'm doing um, some fight choreography from Iron Man 2. And it is the, probably the biggest laugh in the show. And um, that's been another thing that's been interesting that I've learned over the years is uh, I am not playing it for comedy. I'm doing the fight choreography as well as I can, but I know that there's a disconnect between like me in the Black Widow outfit, wearing a red wig, what people expect, the the uh, juxtaposition of a person's expectations with me not really selling it for comedy, for somehow people think it is the funniest thing they've ever seen. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little bit un unexpected, I think, for a lot of audiences for you to not be selling it as comedy. And that probably yeah. that 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 disorientation of it being like a little unexpected is probably part of what works, I would think. Yeah, I think it's also what lets me do it so many times over and over. Like that in theater, you have to have this sort of stamina for doing certain things. And I think if I was putting quotes around it or like in some way selling myself short, or saying like, haha, it's me doing it. 
I think I would get tired of doing it after a while. But it's actually just me just trying to do like a cartwheel successfully. Which can you do nights. it? Yeah, I can do it most nights. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Although right now I have fro I have frozen shoulder right now, so I don't know if I can. <laughs> I have to modify. Um, well, you know, we believe in modifications and adjustments for accommodation around these parts. So yeah. uh, we would love to see your modified cartwheel. <laughs> it doesn't look like you're in a place where you have space to show us. No, no, no. So I want to, <laughs> to do it now. But um, but I'm wondering, like, when when would you play fat for laughs? Like, is is there are we allowed to have fat jokes? Is it funny? Is it always offensive? Is it always, is there a way to do it where it's not at our expense? Like when can your fat body be funny on stage or, you know, or on TV? For me, it's, it's when, when you try to tackle the stereotypes, when you try to, um, tackle the ideas that, um, you know, like the, the idea that, that fat people are, are eating all the time or that we don't exercise or that, you know, like one of the things that we did was we did a parody song of the song physical from Olivia Newton, John. And, um, and so we were all in workout gear and, and doing, you know, a routine to that song. And we changed the words so that, you know, it's let's get physical, but you know, let's also get sexual. Let's also get, let's also get, you know, connected. Let's also get, um, let's also get in our bodies and feel good about ourselves. And so I think there are ways to tell jokes that are fat jokes. If you're finding, if you're smart and also finding a way to do it where when it's us telling the joke about mm -hmm. something that we've experienced, as opposed to someone who doesn't know anything about being fat, telling jokes based on stereotypes. Mm -hmm. yeah, the yeah. physical video is a really interesting um, example, too, of a, a place where something has nothing to do with fatness, and then there's just a fat joke inserted because we think it's funny to insert a fat joke. Like, for folks who don't remember that song, it's this Olivia Newton-John, like, monster hit from the 80s. And the song itself is actually about getting physical in a sexual way. But the video was at the same time as sort of the height of... Um, of like workout fashion becoming aerobics and, fashion yeah. And, yeah and aerobics and people doing home videos um step aerobics and stuff and so it's her in a gym but there's a lot of like fat guys working out in a way that is you know is meant to be like look at these fat guys working out not like hey fat guys working out you know like um and so it's just it's i think it's a really interesting example of a of a place in popular culture where like that song had nothing to do with that. And then you just made it about fat people. Um, but then you guys turned it around and made it about fat people in a way that we want to see. And yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, what do you think, Chris? Like what, what's a, what's funny about fat to you? Well, first I want to say, I think that I had like crushes on half of those guys in that video <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> um, I, uh, I guess what I think is, well, first of all, I, I think I'm like less interested in some of the more uh, like hacky things about being fat, mostly because they're like just old, like they're just not that original. I think even if, if you come from other marginalized identities, it's part of it's just like, wow, y'all haven't found anything else about Chinese people except that we eat dog, like they eat dogs or something like, like when I go to a club and they're saying the same thing mm -hmm. over, it's like, First of all, most for the most part, it's not true. But also, it's just like that's been a thing that's been, been said for twenty years. Um, but I actually have recently sort of thought something a little different, which is that um, uh, I I don't know. First of all, I don't really fault actors having to take roles because people have to pay their bills. Um, I try not to be like judgmental about people taking parts like that sometimes, um, especially if they're up up and coming, right? Um, but I also think there's an element to it that's like, okay, just being fat was a joke for a while. But what has been the most annoying about that is that, oh, there's been decades of people like putting on fat suits and like, like, um, there's been a lot of like exploitation of that stereotype by people that aren't fat. And so like, I'm almost like, if somebody wants to cash in on it and like make some money, like, and they need to, then they can like I to me it's not that interesting as an artist because I think there's more specific 
uh, and interesting things to say. And then also, I think like you can tell when a fat joke's being made, whether it's like you know whether or not whether they're you're, they're on your side. And uh, I don't know if you've done a panel yet about the whale, but like when I saw the whale, uh, he went into the fridge and ate like a sandwich that was like. It was just like two pieces of pizza on a piece of bread with grape jelly and he put ranch dressing on it and he put it all on top and he just was like, how it was like, he was like pizza, the hut from Spaceballs or something. And I was just like, is this movie supposed to be on my side? Like there's, or any of the people that I've known, like there is no way that this is like a specifically observed empathic empath, you know, like, uh, being in the shoes of what it's like to be a fat person, it's clearly just like trying to repulse you with the image. And well, something something really interesting about that, Chris, is like we've we've talked quite a bit in our space about the influence of obesity organizations on the making of the whale, mm. and the you know that that the only fat people that those filmmakers were exposed to in constructing that story were people who were provided by medical obesity organizations right mm -hmm. and i'm wondering if where is there opportunity for you all or where have you been able to behind the scenes to sort of like influence a, a character like an authentic representation of fatness or of or of your racial identities or something else you you live and and learn i mean live and want other people to learn about better like like do you have you you are producers yourselves and you are writers but do you also have opportunities to work with other writers and producers around things like hey if you're going to make a movie about a fat guy maybe talk mm -hmm. to some fat people who weren't provided to you by weight loss doctors like do you get to do that i don't know if nikki may share this experience i do feel a little spoiled in like the la comedy scene that i don't encounter as many comedians in the like UCB world or whatever that are like, we're gonna make fat jokes in our stuff. Um, but specifically, I have not been able to influence it. I haven't been in a position to like uh, advise on something like that in terms of a fat character. I have once been in the early stages of a play where there was a character that was a like Korean nail technician. And that that has actually come up multiple times in my career where Someone sent me a script and I'm like, if the only appeal of this character is that they have an accent, um, I'll sort of either decline it or I'll say like, this is why I'm declining this. Uh, but in that play that I wrote, they basically rewrote the character. Um, so that's been a chance to do it. Uh, but no, I haven't been like in like the stages of creating a film or something where like you could, it, I could meaningfully consult on that. What about you, Nikki? Have you had a chance to influence other people's projects besides just um, starting your own? I, I was in a short film once a few years ago, uh, where, where the writer and director wanted to talk about body positivity, but didn't have a whole lot of, uh, didn't have a lot of experience with fat liberation, with the fat liberation movement. And so she got advice from an obesity organization and uh and that was going to be the organization that was sort of like sponsoring the film and this bothered me <laughs> so uh so i had like a, a real sort of heart to heart with the director and explained that like i can't for my own brand i can't be associated with anything that's kind of connected to dieting or or the, the obesity industry or whatever and um and she was really receptive and really um really supportive of trying to find ways to um to have positive images and positive um representations uh and so and, and it turned out to be a really beautiful film so um i i can't say that the conversation i had with her made her change her creative vision or anything. I think she always had a vision for there to be a size diversity in the, in the story. Um, but I think it was the first time, I think she, she wasn't as well versed in fat liberation. So it was nice to be able to educate her in some way. Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing that work. Um, I'm gonna ask you a question from the chat. And um, 
the setup is uh, the person started, well, I'll just read it. I started doing comedy in the past few months. I didn't realize how horribly offensive some of the comics could be. How did you stay motivated and cultivate community when so many local comics are straight up homophobic, racist, ableist, fat phobic, etc.? Um, what's different about comedy and acting? How did you build community in the comedy world um, in the, you know, in the bodies and the racial identities that you have? Or any of your other identities. I don't want to leave out any of the other other parts of you either. Um, you know, especially since our questioner says, you know, homophobic, racist, ableist, fat phobic, the list goes on. In all the ways that you show up as yourself, how did you community how did you build community as stand up comedians? So I started stand up by taking a class and that class created community for me. So I, you know, I have a lot of friends who I know still from that class. Um, so I was not going to open mics by myself where um, in the beginning, at least I wasn't going to open mics alone where you hear all of the horrible jokes about SA and about about fat jokes. I mean, they're the jokes are horrible like so and and if and if you're in an open mic alone particularly if a woman and in an, in an, alone at an open mic where people are telling you know penis jokes and all the nonsense um it can be really demoralizing you you know you sit there and you think this can't be what people think is funny um but what's been really helpful for me is is having a little posse of people that i do open mics with um, well, I hate open mics. I don't do them a whole lot anymore, but when I do, when I would go to them, um, but then the other thing that was really helpful for me was learning that I'm allowed to call people out for their, for their nonsense. So, uh, if somebody, you know, if a comic who was on stage before me made a fat joke, when I come on stage, I acknowledge the fat joke and I make another joke <laughs> or I like, I find a way to reframe it. Or, you know, I did a, I did a show once where the comic right before me did a whole like five minute bit about uh, being on an airplane, sitting next to a fat person. Mm -hmm. And, and I was like, if you wanted to be comfortable, you should have stayed at your house. Like, you, you know, like, like the, the airplane is not made for you to relax and and recline and and have a restful day you're on an airplane it's not it's you know like and so i did a whole i don't remember exactly what i said but i did a whole thing about that um and and if they really wanted to be comfortable they should have got to notice that person better and pillowed up and pillowed up right mm -hmm. but what i think is so it's so interesting though is that um i think that a lot of comics don't expect a fat comic to call them out on their fat jokes. And so they think that they, they think that they can, you know, it's low hanging fruit. They think they can make fat jokes and like, no one's going to care, but I find so much joy in getting on stage and calling people out for that and, and finding a way to sort of like teach the audience that that's not okay in a way that makes them laugh at the same time. Love it. What about you, Chris? How did you find community amongst the uh, the stage comedians? Um, I did start more on the improv side, which uh, sort of brings more of a community just because there's like it's a group activity and you have to do it. Um, I will say that to uh, Francisca's question that um, I open mics are terrible. And so when I said, like, I had the luxury of, like, an L.A. community that isn't really, like, into making fat jokes, I was not including the open mic theme, uh, which is truly uh, awful. Horrendous. I think that one thing that is heartening is that um, uh, it, because you do worry sometimes, it's like, oh, is this what people think is funny? And it's like, oh, actually, at a, pay, at a level where you're getting paid, like, those jokes don't work. Like, like at a certain point, you have you. Uh, you won't have to be exposed to those people, but you do have to make it through these levels where there's a lot of them around. And so um, one thing I will say is that there is sort of a, like this, um, <clears throat> almost like a trope in standup that you have to grind in these like horrible open mic situations. And I agree that they're pretty awful for people, but specifically for women. And that uh, I have seen lots of people build alternate ways to, because really all that matters is that you have to develop material and you have to develop the ability to be on stage and have stage presence, right? There's nothing like magical about being in a horrible bar 
uh, surrounded by people you don't like that will do that. It is a way that some people develop those skills, but they're just skills. So, and also this kind of um, open mic grind doesn't quite exist in the same way in other countries and other countries have stand up comedy. So they, they must have gotten there somehow. So I do think there's a value to, for example, people building like uh, curated open mics. That's something some people do. Some people only, you know, they, they invite their friends uh, or they even like curate who is coming to see them. Um, really, if, if your local scene and the open mics available to you is not working for you, then, um, you just find I, I would encourage them to find a different way to get the stage time. Also, do encourage a class. Like a class, you will have a built-in community coming out of that. Thank you. Um, I feel like we only have a little bit of time left, and I've asked you a bunch of really serious questions. And I know that you are more than comedians, but I want to make sure that you uh, get a chance to be your funny selves if you would like to. Is there something funny that's happened to you recently that you would like to share with us? Ooh. Funny just in general. <laughs> sure. Oh man. I mean if you've got one. I'm trying to think of things that I that I'm trying to think what has happened to me recently. <laughs> right. I mean, po post pandemic a lot of my life is like, is my life happening? What's mm -hmm. happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, post pandemic uh, it's like I don't even know how to be social anymore. I don't even know how to have conversations. So I'm thinking about it and I'm like, nothing funny is happening to me because I don't go anywhere anymore. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I was thinking about this earlier when we were talking about some of the representation stuff is that, um, you know, I think sometimes when I think if you're if you're watching this and you're someone that creates art, if you're an actor or a comedian or whatever, I think there's sort of a OK, I think there's a value in like, let me create something that is um uh in line with like what i believe in terms of this particular issue let me support the images or the concepts that i want to do but i also think there's a part of like of like just make something that is fun for you that is something that expresses you and also you might agree with the like what what everybody else agrees with 95%, but we might be interested in like the 5% that is the specific insight that you could bring that somebody else couldn't write the, the boilerplate line. And I bring this up because um, in the Scarlett Johansson show that I had, I had a lot of things about like race and casting and diversity. And I would say my first version of that script was very correct. So um, it was like the things you would say um, like at a, like, if you brought got brought into like a corporate seminar to say about diversity and a friend of mine was like this is good but like i agree with all this already and you're not bringing any specificity of your own life into it um so like i love all these ideas but i also want them to be fun you know what i mean like i think we can exist in like as fun funny <coughs> talented sexy people and so I guess my when you ask me, like, do I have a, a politics about my body? Um, I think part of mine is just like just trying to exist as front and center as I can and having that almost be like the statement, which is like I'm not going to uh, shy away from like being in the spotlight just because other people think I shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we say, you know, we say and one of my favorite hashtags is fat visibility is activism. It doesn't have to, you know, like just being there as you. Yeah. And in all those other ways too. Nikki, I want to let you answer that. And then we have one more question from the audience. I'll I'll give y'all before we wrap up. Did you want to add anything to, to what Chris shared there? No, just, I, I agree that, that just, you know, with what you just said, the fat liberation is presence is just being there. Like one of the things that we thought was so magical about Fatch is that you've never seen six like actual fat women on stage at the same time, you know, so, sometimes in their underwear, um, <laughs> you know, being funny. And, and so I think just the act of putting ourselves out there is, is revolutionary in so many ways. And I, I think it's so important to, you know, to, to not shy away from the responsibility of being, 
of of owning the space that you're in and ta- and and being able to say, you know, I'm here. I'm here and I'm funny and I'm fabulous and, you know, love me or leave or, 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 you know, screw you. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Kristen wants to know, um, about costuming. Um, she is working on a PhD about fat representation in TV and film and in comedy in particular and the impact of creative agency. And the question is, what has been your experience with costuming? Have you been comfortable physically and emotionally with the process and the costume choices? Have you had experiences where costumers where costumers have been open to collaborating with you or providing you with agency around costuming? I have had the experience, uh, I've had a negative experience around costuming where, like, where I I showed up and they didn't have a costume that fit me. Um, you know, they, they have something called a size card, which, which tells you all the sizes that the actor wears. Um, but they apparently didn't, either they didn't believe my size card or they didn't have my size card. So when I showed up, there was nothing to wear. So I had to wear, I had to supply my own clothes. Um, and that, that's happened a couple times. So, and I've definitely had, as a woman of color, I've been on sets where they didn't have makeup artists who knew how to do makeup for my skin tone. So um, have I had an opportunity to collaborate um, I don't think I have. I don't think I've had an opportunity to collaborate with a costume designer, um, but would love to. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Chris, you've mentioned a couple of costumes along the way here, and you've mostly mentioned your nearly naked costumes, I <laughs> noted. Right. Um, what's, what's your dream costume? What's something you really would like to get to dress up for on stage? Well, first of all, I always argue for like more exposure because I sweat a lot and I'm just like, I love a nice, cool (laughs) costume where I get to not be under a bunch of layers. I I haven't really um, experienced as much of this, I think. And I think that is a, I do think that's an intersectional thing that um, men in general, like we're just clothed and more just like, we just go to old Navy and bought you some jeans, you know, like, um, uh, there <laughs> at least the parts that I've played, there hasn't been as much thought about like um presenting yourself as like in an objective fied way, you know. Um I will say that sometimes I, I've had an issue sometimes where it's almost like the wardrobe people have their own dysmorphia where they again they have a size card and they'll they'll uh I get there for the fitting and they have a shirt that's like three sizes larger than I am then is listed on the size card and it's like and and it's like is it because this um plumber character is supposed to be comic relief and like you've just bought a shirt that's like crazily not my size at all like and occasionally like a few times it was like well that's what we bought that's what you're wearing and then like those times i was in something that was just like i don't love this i will say the only time that i was collaborative which is not really necessarily about fat liberation but it was very interesting was i was in a fedex commercial where i played a matador I was playing a character dressed up as a matador and um, they uh, matadors in real life are uh, generally quite small. I think I don't know why, uh, but maybe I think they're like horse jockeys, but they tend to be small. So um, the matador costumes available to order were not big enough for me. So the, this is for FedEx. So they had a lot of money. They custom made me a matador costume overnight. Now, I don't know if it was durable. FedEx better do it overnight. Right. (laughs) I don't don't know if it was durable because it was all hot glued together. But I had a matador costume. Oh, I made costumes. A custom matador costume fit to my size, made for me. And it looked amazing. It was like, had all these like little deep Baroque details and stuff on it. Um, And then, yeah, a lot of times in commercials, you can say like, hey, can I... uh, get or buy these clothes off of you like uh, because the wardrobe doesn't want to like return them back to wherever you can often like buy your own clothes off of a shoot um and uh no they were like no this is going to like the vice president of fedex he's like taking it home with him (laughs) so he got to keep it (laughs) well i am a fan of hot glue costumes folks who've been around here for a while may know that already so i love 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 that story but i'm so sorry you didn't get to keep the matador costume yourself (laughs) I'd be wearing uh, it every day. 
<laughs> so we're um we're just about at the end of the time. We always like to make sure you got to say the things you wanted to say. So the closing question is, is there anything we didn't ask you about that you wish we had asked you about? Um Nikki, let's start with you. Oh no. Um I can't think of anything. Um I this was really great. I had a great time and I and yeah, no, I can't think of anything. Chris, what about you? Uh, the only thing I would say, it's not really a question you would have asked me, but I would just tell everyone to date fat people. <laughs> like, um, I actually know that, I mean, just because I have, I, I, I love fat people. <laughs> so, uh, but I know that sometimes um, in this world, there can be a way of expressing the way you feel about yourself by not dating fat people you know what i mean like um that you it's a way sometimes of of sometimes that's where our bad feelings about ourselves go they go towards other people i guess i'm just describing projection basically i don't know i didn't just invent the concept of projection uh but i would say like um i don't know if you haven't yet date one they're awesome yeah um, yeah, Nicole Byer has created a whole podcast around why won't you date me, right? Like, date, yeah. yes, date fat people. I love, I love that. That's definitely not what I expected to get out of our hour together. <laughs> but I yeah. love ending on that note. Thank you so much. Um, let's just have you tell folks one more time where they can find you, follow you, buy tickets for your upcoming shows. What, what's, what's next for you and where should people be keeping track of you? Chris? Yeah, uh, I'm on TikTok and Instagram at Chris Grace Comedy. Uh, I'm also at ChrisGrace.com. And uh, I am doing a show at the Elysian Theater in Los Angeles next Tuesday, 9.30 p.m. That is my show, Chris Grace as Scarlett Johansson. Um, and then I will be in uh, Boston, Austin, uh, Scotland again. I'll be all over the place. It'll be on my website. But uh, yeah, please come by. And Nikki, where can folks, what's next for you and where can folks find out more about it? You can find me at NikkiBaileyComedy.com uh, or Nikki Bailey underscore on TikTok, Instagram, and X or Twitter. Um, and yeah, I don't have anything on the calendar right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm working on a show, so I don't have, I, I, I don't have, you know, any, um, performance is coming up but yeah in the behind the scenes stuff right i'm now. in the behind the scenes stuff right now so well um well we loved having you here um this has been so great thank you so much for giving us this time this evening and of course just to remind everybody where you you can uh if you know people who should have been here to hear um everything we got to learn about from nikki and chris this video will be available on YouTube later, as are um, m many of our virtual events, the NAFA webinar series, um, Ahead of the Curve, which is our fashion show. Of course, some of you have seen Tamra Talks, which is our uh, our quick Insta Instagram live show. And um, we do uh, lots of really great virtual events, and we hope you will join us for more of them. You can find us at naafa.org. And of course, if you want to support this kind of programming or any of the other important work that we are doing to make the world a better place for fat people. Um, you can also support us by, um, by contributing. We are a 501c3 charity and your contribution is tax deductible as applicable by law. Uh, so thank you all for being with us and we will see you next time for the NAFA webinar series. Take care, everyone. Bye everybody. Bye.